Hi everyone, welcome to another edition of Hub Bytes. I'm Sunil Rege, consultant psychiatrist, and today I'll be taking you through withdrawal symptoms related to antidepressants with a specific focus on withdrawal symptoms related to SSRIs, which are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So let's get going. Here is the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron with the receptor sites. Now we know that SSRIs block the serotonin transporter, which is essentially the protein that takes serotonin into the presynaptic neuron for breakdown. Now what SSRIs, as I said, does is it will block CERT, and when it blocks CERT, there will be lots of serotonin available in the synaptic cleft. Now what happens when we take away the SSRIs and particularly if we do it suddenly. Now we know that when receptors are bound by serotonin here over an extended period of time, they downregulate. If you take the SSRI away suddenly, the CERT inhibition disappears and these particular receptors will suddenly almost start craving. So they end up with that withdrawal type symptomatology. And it's because of a sudden deficiency of serotonin within the synaptic cleft. So when we look at the diagram, this is what we see. On the left hand side, you can see that you have the CERT, which is the reuptake pump in a way, and the SSRI on the right hand side blocks the reuptake pump and therefore there is lots of serotonin available in the synaptic cleft. When the SSRI is taken away, there will be a deficiency in the synaptic cleft. The receptors that have been downregulated suddenly get upregulated, become super sensitive and start craving in a way. So now let's look at what are the symptoms of SSRI withdrawal, also known as discontinuation syndrome. First, the affective symptoms. You can see individuals can have irritability, anxiety or agitation, low mood or depression, tearfulness or a feeling of dread. So in some cases, it may appear as if they are having a relapse of the illness, but often there are other associated symptoms as well that help in differentiating between a primary depressive illness versus a withdrawal or discontinuation syndrome. Sensory symptoms are quite common. Paresthesias, numbness, shock-like sensations. They describe it as electric shock-like sensations, rushing noises, and palinopsia, which is a visual trail. General somatic symptoms, flu-like symptoms, lethargy or fatigue, headache, tremor, sweating, loss of appetite, weakness, and tachycardia. Then, symptoms of disequilibrium. Dizziness, lightheadedness, vertigo, ataxia, and gait instability. Sleep disruption, insomnia, nightmares, and excessive dreaming. Gastrointestinal symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, anorexia. Sexual symptoms, we, one can have premature ejaculation or genital hypersensitivity. And cognitive symptoms such as decreased concentration, amnesia, or confusion. So this can be a really, really distressing aspect of SSRI treatment because once, and it also happens with SNRIs where the serotonin component's there. So if it's suddenly stopped, or in some cases, even over a period of two to four weeks, because some individuals are a lot more sensitive, patients can experience all of these symptoms. So what are the principles of antidepressant tapering? The effect of a linear tapering regime, so if we simply go from, let's say, escitalopram, 40 milligrams, down to 30, down to 20, down to 10, and stop, which is linear, then individuals may be susceptible to having withdrawal symptoms. And why does that happen? Because let's look at, take the example of citalopram. You can see CERT inhibition decreases by 3% when citalopram is reduced from 20 milligrams to 15 milligrams. When you reduce it further from 15 milligrams to 10 milligrams and from 10 milligrams to 5 milligrams, CERT inhibition decreases by 6% and 13%. So really the drop when you think about it from 20 milligrams down to 5 milligrams is not that significant in terms of CERT inhibition. 
But where the biggest drop for sirtuin inhibition comes is when citalopram is reduced from 5 to 0, where the drop is by almost 58%. And that's where individuals can have significant withdrawal symptoms. And this is reflective of the hyperbolic dose response curve, where it, one reaches a plateau. So if you think about a hyperbolic dose response curve, it looks like this. At lower doses, you will have increases, but then it will reach a sort of hyperbola, a, a plateau. Um, and that's what this is reflective of. And you can see it between 5 to 0, 58% reduction in CERT inhibition. Therefore, according to the, the paper by Horowitz and Taylor in 2019, they suggested when tapering antidepressants, clinicians are suggested to instead follow a regime that fo focuses on biological effect, which is CERT occupancy, rather than arbitrarily withdrawing medication using a linear stepwise approach. From a practical viewpoint, it may be necessary to switch to liquid formulations given the requirement for micro modifications of dose during the later stages of tapering. So let me show you what the CERT occupancy looks like. If you look at the citalopram dose on the left hand side at 60 milligrams, you've got a CERT occupancy of 87.8%. But note as you come down, let's say at 9.1, which is approximately 10 milligrams, you've got a CERT occupancy of 70%. So from 87.8% to 70%, percent, about 17.8 percent decrease, right? Then at 5.4 percent, you've got 60 percent. But once you've gone down to zero, the minimal dose, you've got 10 percent. So it's gone down from 60 percent to 10 percent, almost a 50 percent reduction. And this is what we call that sort of hyperbolic dose response curve that needs to be taken into account when considering reduction of antidepressants. So now let's look at how to practically consider a reduction. And this is from the very helpful uh, guidance by the Royal College of Psychiatrists in the UK, where they outlined uh, the article, the stopping antidepressants. So they've given the example of paroxetine. So as you can see, if we consider a reduction of dose by 50% every two to four weeks, now we know that some people may need to reduce a lot more slowly. So this is one approach. You can see starting off at 40 milligrams a day of paroxetine, then dropping it down to 20 milligrams a day, then to 10, then to 5, but then going really, really slow because we know that because of the hyperbolic dose response curve, from 5 as I go down to 0, that's when CERT, the reduction in CERT inhibition will be the highest. And therefore, this is where you might want to consider liquid formulations. Now, in some countries, tapering strips are also available. So this is where one can discuss it with the pharmacy or compounding form formulations can be utilized. So from 5 milligrams a day, you're going to 2.5 milligrams liquid form, then to 1.25, then to 0 0.6, and then finally stopping it. The other approach is considering a reduction by 10% of the last dose every two to four weeks using tablets and liquids. So this is when individuals, you've considered the first reduction and individuals are very sensitive to that uh, reduction. So they experience significant withdrawal symptoms. That tells you, okay, I need to go slower. So here you can see you're going down from 40 milligrams to 36. And in order to achieve 36, you're using 30 milligram tablet plus a liquid formulation to achieve the six milligrams. And then you go further down to 32, 29, 26, so on and so forth until you finally stop medication. Okay, so let's now look at ranking antidepressants based on their propensity for a withdrawal or discontinuation syndrome. As you can see, agamalatine has negligible withdrawal syndrome risk. Lower risk antidepressants would be bupropion and fluoxetine. And fluoxetine mainly because it has a long half-life. Fluoxetine's metabolite nor fluoxetine has a half-life of five to seven days. Therefore, complete washout would be approximately in 35 days. You multiply the half-life by five and that's the washout period. And therefore, fluoxetine tends to have a lower severity and considered to have a lower incidence of withdrawal syndrome. However, it is important to recognize that the withdrawal syndrome with fluoxetine 
can occur much later compared to other antidepressants. When we think about moderate risk antidepressants, we have citalopram, we have escitalopram. Mirtazapine also features here and mirtazapine has antihistaminergic effect which gives sedation but also can contribute to weight gain. Now when we stop mirtazapine, one can have an antihistaminergic rebound, so something to think about. Amongst the other novel antidepressants, we have vortioxetine, which also has a moderate risk because it is a serotonin modulator. From a high-risk perspective, we've got amitriptyline, clomipramine, paroxetine, venlafaxine, and duloxetine. And paroxetine has a short half-life and therefore will have a more severe um, withdrawal syndrome. Similarly, venlafaxine and desmethyl venlafaxine have higher rates of withdrawal syndrome and quite distressing withdrawals as well. Now, when we think about the pharmacokinetics, and the reason why we think about pharmacokinetics is mainly we're thinking about the half-life. We know that when we looked at the dose response curve, we have a hyperbolic dose response curve for antidepressants. Similarly, when we are reducing antidepressants, we've got to follow a hyperbolic dose reduction. So as I mentioned with fluoxetine, which has a long half-life, withdrawal syndrome severity and withdrawal syndrome incidence may be lower. But when we look at sertraline, citalopram and escitalopram, whose half-lives vary between 26 to 33 hours to 36 hours, here you might have withdrawal syndromes. And in paroxetine, for example, which has 20-hour uh, half-life, here, withdrawal syndrome can start pretty early in about two to three days even. So this is something to take into account when considering reduction of antidepressants. So the article, Tapering of SSRI Treatment to Mitigate Withdrawal Syndrome Symptoms by Horowitz and Taylor stated, We suggest that a personalized rate for withdrawal could be established by an initial trial reduction of SSRI dose equivalent to a reduction of 10% serotonin transporter occupancy or 5% if being cautious, with subsequent monitoring of the severity and duration of withdrawal symptoms. An initial 10% reduction of in serotonin transporter occupancy is suggested because this would result in approximately halving the dose from the therapeutic minimum dose from 20 mg to 10 mg of citalopram, which is tolerated well by most patients. If the patient discontinuation emergent signs and symptoms score, which is a scale, were to have returned to baseline one month after the initial reduction, then a rate equivalent to 10% reduction of serotonin transporter occupancy per month could be prescribed. This process should be subject to ongoing monitoring with the rate titrated to patient tolerance. So with that, I hope that this is something you can apply to clinical practice because a linear reduction of dose, so from 40 milligrams of escitalopram down to 30 to 20 to 10 and then stopping can result in quite significant withdrawal symptoms. So the aim here is to follow a hyperbolic dose reduction to reduce to the therapeutic minimums and then even further reductions below the therapeutic minimums may be required to prevent a distressing or any signs and symptoms of withdrawal symptoms. So with that, do have a read of the, the article that I've suggested. And of course, do visit Psych Scene Hub for other educational material as well. So take care, stay safe. I hope to see you in another video of Hub Bites. See you soon.